should we start? Okay. Dear distinguished guests, researchers, and representatives from private sector, I would like to welcome you to the Transcountry International Networking Event on behalf of TÜBİTAK. TÜBİTAK is the leading research funding agency in Turkey, and we have been involved in the Transcan network since its foundation in 2011. With our Transcountry partners, we are committed to fund translational cancer research, and we also support EU's Beating Cancer Plan and the Cancer Mission by raising awareness and enabling international cooperation for cancer research. Today, you will get first-hand information about the 2021 call from Dr. Silvia Paradisi from the Transcountry Coordination Team. Then, Ms. Anne Charlotte Fawel will give a presentation about the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine, EATRIS, and collaboration opportunities under the call. After a short break, we will have a pitching session for presenting project ideas. In the afternoon, you will also have a chance to meet face-to-face -face via the B2B Match platform if you have booked one-to-one -one, one meetings. Uh, today, we have gathered more than 260 participants from public and private research organizations, universities, and hospitals. Uh, I have been a partner in Transcan since 2014, I think, representing Tubitak, and I am very glad to see such an interest for the call and the event in such a short time. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants and wish you a fruitful networking event. And uh, I would also like to invite Mr. Alexander Bakovsky from Turkey in Horizon 2020 Phase 2 Technical Assistance Project who helped us organize this meeting for his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Esge, for introducing me. <clears throat> and uh, I would like, uh, first of all, I would like welcome all of you and to thank you for such uh, high interest in participation to this event. It seems that it's really uh, needed. Uh, to support your participation and help you in uh, creation partnerships. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, share with you uh, only a few uh, very brief uh, information about uh, our uh, technical assistance project. So I'm team leader of a Turk in Horizon 2020, which is the which is a technical assistance project. Uh, this, is, this project is jointly funded by European Union and Republic of Turkey and implemented by the Ministry of Industry and Trade of the Republic of Turkey. Uh, we, uh, we are here to, um, to support uh, we are working very closely with Tubitak. We are supporting uh, Tubitak, and this event is organized in the frame of our project. And uh, the aim of our project is to increase participation of uh, Turkish organizations, Turkish stakeholders in Horizon Europe, and also facilitate integration of uh, Turkish researchers into European research area. We are doing that through organization of different types of trainings, starting from info days, awareness raising, up to proposal writing camps, and also networking events. Uh, I would like to underline uh, this networking events, which are a very effective tool to uh, create partnerships between Turkish stakeholders and European ones uh, from European Union and also associate, other associated countries. So we are, we have, uh, we are in Tur working in Turkey since 2019 and uh, will provide support until 2022. 20, uh, uh, we organized uh, two uh, quite uh, successful international brokerage events, one in Istanbul, one in uh, Brussels. Uh, they were dedicated to ICT and the cities of future uh, with the, participation of more than 700 persons, both events, and for each event, we had more than 1,000 face-to-face -face 
meetings. We are also we have also organized uh, international networking meetings similar to the one we have today. There were two previous ones were dedicated to health sector, to European gene program, a joint program on rare diseases, one on innovative medicine initiative. There were also other uh, thematic areas covered like uh, electronic uh, components and uh, systems, Excel joint undertaking, batteries, uh, and also quite big event, uh, online event, uh, networking event on Green Deal call in October 2020. And now we are coming to today's event dedicated to TransCan Aeronet joint transnational call and uh, uh, with thematic of next generation of cancer, which is a very important uh, subject, uh, very relevant for Horizon Europe as well, and the uh, Horizon Europe uh, missions. So uh, that's all from my side, and we will uh, move now to more details. You will get more detailed information about the call uh, from, uh, from our speakers. Uh, and uh, as, the, as the final statement, I would like to encourage you to cooperate and contribute uh, your to, to our post-event survey. Your opinion are very important for us, and we would like to know uh, uh, about this, about the event as such, and also about outcomes of this event. So please uh, uh, support us in filling questionnaires and providing your your your your feedback. So uh, back to you, Esga. Thank you. Um, and now uh, I also would like to uh, tell you that uh, if you benefit from this event, we can always organize new events. Uh, I know the pandemic had put a strain on cancer research and cancer patients, but um, on just a minor plus side is being able to network online. Uh, I think that uh, online meetings has become the norm at the moment. And of course, uh, if you benefit from this event, we can uh, we can also organize another meeting uh, as a follow-up or another info day for next year's call as well. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Silvia Paradisi from ISS and the Italian Ministry of Health for her presentation on Transcancy and the uh, joint call. Hi, Silvia. Good to see you. Hi, Ozge. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Silvia Paradisi. I represent uh, the Italian Ministry of Health, which is the coordinator of the Transcancy project and the Italian National Institute of Health, which collaborates with the Ministry in the management of the Joint Transnational Call. I'm going to share my presentation. Okay. Um, can you see everything? Not no, yet. we can't, Sylvia. Can you please reshare? It is good to open your presentation first, then share screen, please. Okay. Sorry for uh, I've I've made several. Uh... Can you see now? Now, are you sharing the screen? Yes, I am. Mm, I, I've made several uh, attempts, but uh, I'm sorry for... Uh... Do you, Sylvia, do you want me to share your presentation on behalf of you, uh, if it is okay for you? Yes, it's okay. Thank you. Oh. 
Hope you can see it now. Please okay. tell me, just move forward and we can proceed. Okay, um, thank you very much. Sorry for uh, these uh, troubles. Uh, so firstly, I would like to thank again uh, Tubitak, Ozge, and the, the Turkey in Horizon 2020 for the organization of this uh, networking event, and also the colleagues of Transcan that I know have collaborated in it. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the Transcantry project, uh, and uh, then I will give you more details about uh, the Joint Transnational Call 2021, which is the main focus of this uh, networking event on next generation cancer immunotherapy targeting the tumor microenvironment. Next slide, please. Well, the Transcountry project uh, is uh, an ERANET sustained collaboration of national and regional programs in cancer research. It has just started, funded by the European Commission under Horizon 2020. It started in March and it will last for five years. The goal of this project, uh, as I said before, it is coordinated by the Italian Ministry of Health. The goal of this project is to coordinate uh, national and regional funding programs for research in the area of translational cancer research. The challenge is to promote a transnational collaborative approach between scientific teams in the demanding area of translational cancer research. Uh, with the goal uh, to avoid uh, the duplication of efforts, uh, ensuring uh, a efficient use of uh, available uh, resources, to produce uh, significant results of higher quality and impact through the funding of uh, excellence uh, projects. And uh, Transcantry has uh, strong elements of continuity with the previous Transcant programs. Next one, please. Um, the consortium of trans country is composed of um, 31 partners from uh, 20 countries, uh, ministries, funding agencies, uh, research councils, and also private uh, char charities. And uh, these uh, partners comes from uh, 15 member uh, European member states from uh, three associated countries and for two third countries. Next one, please. Uh, as said before, Transcantry is in continuity with uh, the previous uh, program, Transcan and Transcan2. Uh, overall, uh, these uh, two projects uh, have uh, launched and successfully completed uh, um, seven uh, joint transnational calls on cancer research since 2011 on several uh, topics. Uh, from uh, validation of biomarkers, uh, um, primary and secondary prevention on cancer, ter tertiary prevention in cancer patients, uh, uh, human tumor heterogeneity, immunology and immunotherapy, uh, early detection uh, uh, of cancer, and uh, research on rare cancer. Um, the participation of uh, funding organization in the calls uh, is uh, variable from one to another, uh, from 15 to 25, and uh, the earmarked budget uh, per each call is, uh, was from nine to 17 million, and the spent budget uh, from six to, uh, to more than 17 millions. The next one, please. So overall, in seven uh, call for proposal, uh, we have uh, had um, uh, 85, more than 85 million euro invested by 28 funders uh, from 19 countries. In total, 79 projects uh, have been funded, and uh, this project uh, involved 406 research groups. The next one, please. Um, the participation in call has been uh, successfully. 
successful and uh, we received the total uh, amount of 479 uh, in 69 uh, projects uh, of which 79 were funded the success rate uh, in participation of uh, from the pre-proposal to the funded project was uh, an average of 15.3 uh, in total, uh, 2,800 about uh, researchers uh, applied to the call. And uh, the gender distribution in funded project is 30% uh, female and 70% male. The next slide, please. So after uh, this overview on uh, the Transcan uh, program in, uh, in the past and uh, in the present, because many funded projects are still ongoing, obviously, let's have some more detail about uh, the um, ongoing call. The open call uh, just uh, opened a few days ago uh, about uh, next generation cancer immunotherapy targeting the tumor microenvironment. Next one, please. The aims of the call are um, detailed on the call text, uh, identification and validation uh, of TMA subclasses, tumor microenvironment subclasses, and their contribution to the resistance mechanisms, uh, translational research using tumor samples co collected from retrospective and or prospective course of patients. And then we have uh, three sub-aims. The second aim is targeting a tumor microenvironment to improve efficacy of immunotherapy in human patients, uh, which uh, contains other three sub-aims. Research proposal should focus on at least one of the listed sub-aims or, aim or sub-aims. Next one, please. Uh, the funding model, uh, the call um, JTC 2021 uses the virtual common pot funding model. Uh, this means that funding will be made available uh, by each national regional funding organization which participate in the call according to their specific regulation for research groups in their country or region, as detailed in the Annex 2 of the call text. Then this is a co-funded call, co-funded by the European Commission. This means that the European Commission can contribute with about 33% of the, spend, of the budget spent by the funding organization. And, but this contribution will be made available through the national regional funding agency. So the, it is a, a, a mechanism um, that is the RNET co-fund model, but the researchers don't know about the, this uh, percentage of funding they receive. Um, because of the funding model, uh, it is relevant that all the applicants check carefully the guideline for applicants to follow the national regional re regulation and also to determine if they, they are eligible for funding. The next one, please. Uh, the composition of research consortia. Um, uh, this is obviously is a very practical indication. All uh, what I'm going to explain is um, contained in the call text, and uh, there are also additional information. Uh, each research consortium must involve a minimum of three and a maximum of six partners eligible for funding from different countries whose funders participate in the call. The partners must be from at least three different countries participating in the call. This is to guarantee the transnational, that a project is transnational, is a collaborative. A consortium must involve no more than two research group from the same country. Obviously, in the, if this is the case, uh, the minimum number of groups uh, in that consortium uh, must be four, uh, so to keep the represent 
representation, the representativeness of at least the three countries. Uh, we recommend to include teams from all the countries and regions partic participating in the call and uh, to give a particular attention to research teams from Latvia, Slovakia and Turkey. But I have to underline that the inclusion of these uh, partners uh, doesn't give any advantage in the assessment of the proposal. It is just a recommendation to favor uh, the um, wide inclusion of uh, several countries. And in addition, one partner not eligible for funding, not eligible because it is from another country uh, with respect to those uh, participating in the call, but uh, or it is from one of the countries with as an organization participating in the call, but it is not eligible uh, based on the rules. Next one, please. Uh, so I again recommend to check the guidelines for applicants and because on the annex, as you see on the right, there are um, the eligibility rules details for each of the participating funding organization and the national contact person to be contacted for any detail. Next one, please. So uh, the, um, the pre-proposal, uh, this is a two-step call. Uh, this means that we have a, a now ongoing, as you already know, uh, the pre-proposal phase. Uh, the submission is open and uh, uh, I mean uh, this, uh, also the submission area that is uh, um, the website is a PT outline. Uh, I have to underline that uh, to access the submission area, a registration is needed. All the details are also on the front page of the call documents. And uh, the coordinator is the person of the consortium who, is in, who has the role of submitting a proposal. And on the submission area, um, there are several, inf several information to be uh, included online, so some fields to be filled. And then uh, the PDF of the proposal uh, has to be uploaded after all the information are uh, provided. Only one single PDF can be uploaded on the system. So after the submission phase that is uh, performed by the coordinator, of course, uh, we receive all the, the joint call secretariat, uh, we'll have the access to all the submitted pre-proposal and it uh, will start the eligibility check. It is uh, in two phases, one formal check made by the call secretariat that is based on the criteria outlined on the call text. So the number of participating countries, the adherence to the forms, the document length and so on. And then the national regional eligibility check where each funding organization verify the eligibility of the applicants to the call for his country or region. Uh, it's uh, relevant to underline that the non-compliance with the eligibility rules would lead to the rejection of the entire proposal without further review. After uh, the eligible pre-proposal uh, have been checked, uh, they go to the evaluation phase that is made by a panel of um, experts in uh, immunology and immunotherapy of cancer. Uh, this panel is the scientific evaluation committee. Each pre-proposal uh, will be allocated to two experts for evaluation and the criteria for the evaluation are those excellence, impact, quality and efficiency for, of, the, of the implementation, those used and recommended by the European Commission. Next one, please. 
So the um, successful uh, pre-proposals after the evaluation phase uh, um, will be invited to the second step uh, so to prepare and submit a full proposal also they received the full proposals at the end of the second step will be checked for eligibility because uh, the full proposal must adhere to the pre-proposal in terms of uh, consortium composition and content of the project uh, unless there are uh, some uh, changes could be allowed um, by with um, relationships with uh, an exchange after exchanges uh, with the call secretariat uh, and or the interested funding agency. Uh, so uh, the eligible for proposals will be evaluated uh, with following the same criteria as uh, said before. It will be evaluated uh, each proposal by two SEC members and uh, two new external reviewers. Uh, after the assessment, uh, it will be prepared a, a ranking list, confidential, obviously. Um, and um, the ranking list is based uh, exclusively on the evaluation made by the SEC and uh, but the proposal selected for funding will consider both the ranking list established by the scientific evaluation committee and the, uh, avail the funding available for each of the partner um, in, the, in the project. Next one please. So um, this is uh, the call schedule with the main steps uh, that uh, are of interest for the applicants. Uh, as we see, and as, we, and as you probably already know, the deadline for pre-proposal submission is uh, the end of June. And um, on the 5th of November, uh, there will be the communication of the results uh, to all the coordinators and the invitation for, uh, the, success, for uh, the successful uh, pre-proposal to prepare the full proposal. Um, from 19th of November to the 20th of December, uh, it will be possible to submit the full proposal. Uh, in May 22, uh, we expect to be able to send the communication of the final funding decision to the applicants. And the project uh, can start uh, as soon as uh, the, all the national procedures uh, are uh, completed, hopefully by October or November 2022, but also earlier is if necessary. Next one, please. That's all. I thank you very much for your attention. The email of the um, Joint Call Secretariat is uh, jtc2021 uh, at transcan.eu. Uh, um, I will be pleased to answer to all your queries, but I strongly recommend also to get in touch with the national representative of your funding organization. I wish you a good work, thanking again the organizers for this event. I'm sure it will be successful and I'm sure it is really useful to favor um, the, the formation of new consortia and, the, and to widen the relationship among researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, we have one question. And also, I would like to encourage participants to put their questions in the box, question and answers box. Um, Maria Caferal uh, has asked, 
Uh, you mentioned that 30% of the projects funded are from female researchers and 70% are from men. Is the success rate the same for women and men? In other words, which, which part percentage of women and men applied? Uh, I don't know if we have the statistics for this as well, for the applications. Uh, you mean uh, the percentage of... Uh... Uh, the percentage in applicants, not yes, in yes. successful project. Um, I, I don't remember exactly. Maybe we have published it, but now, honestly, I don't have this number under my eyes. So I can, I'm sorry, I cannot <laughs> give an answer. Um, as far as I know, um, we have the statistics, but I don't know if we have the analysis. Uh, for the success rates. Uh, more questions coming. Katerina or Katerina Foley uh, asks, to help clarify, two partners can be from countries participating in the call and one partner can be from a country outside of the countries participating in the call. Um, not really, actually. Can you repeat the eligibility rules? Yes, uh, only one partner in each consortium can be uh, outside the um, eligible partners. I mean, a partner that is not from a country or, or cannot be funded from a country, a country funding agency participating in the call can be included in the consortium, but only one. And this, partners, this partner uh, must provide in the full proposal phase confirmation that he has his own funding to perform the work uh, in collaboration with the other partners uh, funded of the consortium. Mm -hmm. And they ask if this country can be the USA. Uh, as far as I know, yes, it can be from the USA, but they have to have their own uh, funding yes. for the ex external partners. Yes, I confirm oh, from any country the important thing is that uh, they can provide uh, a letter uh, that they can they have uh, uh, own funding because uh, no transfer of funding from one partner to another is allowed so they have to be independent uh, economically independent for the work they are committing to perform in the proposal. Um, so another question, is it possible to participate in more, in more than one project uh, in different consortia with different projects? Uh, this is not a rule um, for the call. This is, uh, it depends on the funding organization. I mean, uh, for an Italian partner, it is not allowed, but uh, maybe for other partner, for partners which ask uh, funding to other uh, funding agency, it can be allowed. So this specific question must be made uh, to the national contact person. Yeah, um, I can also comment in Turkey, uh, is it possible, but there are limitations to number of projects that a PI can be involved in. Uh, and also the projects have to be different from each other. So you cannot uh, have the same work packages. You cannot do the same work and get several funding from several projects at, at the same time. Of course. Um, more questions? Mm. So, same questions from two um, participants. I would like to know if the PI or a partner changes institution uh, and really locates to a new institution that is eligible to receive the grant. Will the grant remain in the first in institution or will he be able to answer the grant? transfer the grant in the new institution. I think this also depends on the national rules of the funding. Um, so you have to check with the national, uh, your national funding agency or regional funding agency. 
Yes, uh, I confirm it depends on the rules of the national rules, uh, but uh, usually it is uh, rather difficult to form. I know uh, for experience that uh, for many countries, indeed, the, the beneficiary is the institution and not uh, the researcher uh, himself, but or herself. But um, it depends on, on the national rules. Sometimes it may be possible, it depends. Mm -hmm. Um, so, questions about the ranking list. Uh, is the ranking list for each country or overall? No, no. Uh, the ranking list uh, is uh, made uh, exclusively based on the quality of the whole project. Uh, so, all the projects are assessed, also the full uh, proposals, uh, where uh, there is the contribution, the um, additional evaluations made by the, ex the two external reviewers. There is a, a meeting where all the um, evaluation are discussed, are shared with all the, mem the expert uh, members. And at the end of the meeting, there is a ranking list prepared by the scientific evaluation committee that is only based on the quality of, of yes on the scientific assessment of the project mm -hmm. so the ranking list uh, is the one uh, and unique and uh, it then because of the virtual common pot funding model the um, call steering committee that is the the, all the funding agency that funds the call have to uh, see how many of the best proposal can be funded based on the availability of funding. So this means that uh, maybe the funding is sufficient for 10, for 15, for 20 uh, projects, depending also each project uh, which requests of funding has for uh, each of the funding agency. This is, uh, but uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the selection of projects is made exclusively uh, based on the scientific uh, assessment of the result of the scientific assessment. And especially uh, this one is a co uh, because it is a call co-funded by the European Commission, I have to underline that we have to, um, uh, to involve an external observer who will be invited to our um, evaluation meeting and who will follow all the procedures so to guarantee that uh, we are in line with the co-funded rules uh, set by the European Commission. In Transcan, we have already launched the, at the start of Transcan 2 another co-funded call in 2014 and it was very successful. All the procedures were, were very correctly implemented and also the observer's report was um, very positive. And uh, so we, have, uh, we already have uh, a great experience in managing uh, a co-funded call and uh, the process will be absolutely fair and uh, transparent, but obviously not the ranking list. It cannot be, it remains confidential. Yeah, okay. Uh, one last question and then we can answer the remaining questions uh, by writing. Um, in the questions and answers box. Uh, if there are two partners from one country, one of these should be a clinical partner or could be both preclinical. Uh, I don't think there's a limitation on this. No, okay. there is no limitation. We recommend to involve partners with several um, expertise, clinical, preclinical, but this is just to guarantee that that a project is really translational. So it is just a recommendation. But also in this case, I recommend to check the national rules because some funding 
organization has also um, some different rules about the, the provenience of partner, their expertise and so on. So always uh, check the national contact, per, contact the national contact person. Yes. Um... I would like to answer quickly a few questions. Canada is a partner uh, in the Transcan network. So yes, uh, partners from Canada are eligible for funding. Uh, SMEs in general can be a part of the consortium, but this depends on your national rules. Uh, the budget is also depends on your national rules if there's a budget limit uh, or not. Um, and then, I think we will have answered the rest of the questions in writing in the questions and answers box. And uh, thank you, Sylvia, again for the presentation. And now thank I would you. like to thanks. I would like to invite Ms. Anne Charlotte Cowell, head of European Affairs in AFIS, to present the European infrastructure and collaboration opportunities under this call. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hello everyone, good morning. Uh, first of all, let me thank you, say a big thank you to the organizers for inviting Eatris to speak today um, at this event. Uh, I'm in charge of, well, I'm, I'm Eatris, head of European Affairs. Um, I'm in charge of overseeing AHRA's portfolio of, um, of grants, and I'm also involved um, in our policy actions. Um, so today, um, the next 10 minutes, I wanted to provide you a quick presentation of AHRA's, uh, what the infrastructure is all about. Um, and in the second part of our presentation, I want to provide you with concrete information on how you can utilize our services for preparing your proposal. Um, so first of all, um, for those of you who may not have heard of Eatrice before, we are the European Research Infrastructure for Translational Medicine. Um, so the infrastructure uh, idea was actually created um, in the early 2000s uh, on the rationale that I think we, we all very well aware of that medicine development um, is still uh, very costly, a high uh, chance of failure, and that it takes too long to reach the patients. So the idea behind having an academic infrastructure in Europe for translational medicine was really to pull all the existing um, academic resources in Europe. So the expertise, the facilities, the technologies, um, and ensuring that um, this pooling of the resources also helps accelerating the translation of, uh, of research into patient benefit. Um, first, I wanted to... Um, give you a quick overview also about the landscape of life science research infrastructure in Europe. Uh, there's Eatris, but there's of course many more. And uh, maybe you recognize some of, some of those, uh, for example, BMRI for biobanking or ECRON for clinical trials. Uh, so I really invite you to also, uh, not necessarily in the framework of Transcan 3 proposal, but also in your day-to-day -day research to go consult the websites of the infrastructures because they've been created by governments to really support you um, in, uh, in your research. So they all providing different, different types of services. Um, of course, you see there on the left, AHS for translational research. Um, so as I said earlier, um, our core mission is to really accelerate the translation of research discoveries into patient benefits. So we particularly look at um, uh, preclinical and ergonomical research, where there's a high degree of failure of research and also where uh, collaboration between stakeholders is very, is very important. That's why in everything that we do, we always make sure that we uh, encourage this cross-sectoral collaboration. So we do, we do represent academia, but we also work with industry, large pharma, SMEs, patient organizations, regulators, clinicians. So we really wanna make sure that the whole ecosystem of translational research is really addressed in order to um, support um, research and, and increase patient benefits. Um, so we are representing um, many countries. At the moment, we are supported by 14 European member states. Um, we are uh, a non-for-profit organization. Um, we have the, the ERIC legal status. So ERIC stands for European Research Infrastructure Consortium. 
It's a legal status that has been granted to us by the European Commission. Um, here on the left, I highlighted Latvia because I know that for this particular Transcan call, um, participants from Latvia uh, are particularly encouraged to be involved in proposals. Um, so Latvian institutions are part of Beatrice. And in each of these member organizations, um, we have member research institutes, so academic research institutes and university medical centers. So currently we have 113 institutes across those 14 European countries. And we have structured our services around five scientific platforms um, that you'll see are very broad. They really cover a wide range of products uh, from advanced therapies to biomarker, small molecule, but also uh, inflammation and immune monitoring. Here are the few key actions that we're involved in. Um, I won't have time to go through them, unfortunately, but I really invite you to consult our website and look at our project page to learn more about those initiatives. So what do we offer? As I said, because we have these 110 research institutes that are members of Beatrice, um, our main objective is to really provide access to those facilities and expertise. So this is really um, the core of what we do. Um, another important pillar is, is of course, training. Uh, we offer a wide range of training courses uh, for the younger generation of translational scientists, but also senior scientists. Um, and we also have um, quality programs um, to support um, high quality uh, research outputs and international collaborations. Um, as I said earlier, um, Academia industry is, of course, very important for the success of transactional research. So one thing that we do um, is really facilitating those public private collaboration, those partnerships uh, between our members and large pharma or our members and SMEs. And the fourth pillar is centralized consultancy. Uh, I'll say a few words about that in a bit. Uh, where at the headquarters uh, in Amsterdam, uh, we provide uh, direct support to funders and researchers on uh, key aspects in translational research, for example, intellectual property or regulatory strategy, uh, and also health technology assessment, for example. Um, so as I said earlier, we have those five scientific platforms, very broad. Um, so this slide just gives you a very um, quick overview of the expertise and services that are included in each of our five platforms. Um, so you can see that it goes from tissue engineering, uh, GMP facilities to biobank facilities, but also um, imaging technologies um, and also uh, in vivo models, for example, or, or preclinical validation of nanomedicine. So it's very broad. Um, in terms of um, what we can do to support funding applications, so there are three main aspects. Um, the first one, as you probably understood, we have such a large um, consortium of research institutes in our infrastructure. Uh, we can really help you form the consortium, so help you find the right partners for your proposal. Um, the second one is Eatrice itself. So Eatrice Eric um, can join um, your proposal. I added their subcontractor because in this particular case, um, Eatrice is based in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is not a founder involved in Transcan 3, uh, which means that Eatrice is not eligible uh, as a partner. Uh, so one of, the, one of the two options would be to involve Eatrice as an in-can contributor, or if the eligibility rules of the founder allow, uh, to involve Eatrice as a subcontractor. Um, and then the third one is when we actually taking an active role uh, leading projects, which unfortunately, because we're not eligible, would not be possible. So for Transcan 3, uh, joint transnational call of this year, these two aspects are really the, the priorities on, on how we can help you. Um, so what, do, what does Eatrice do when, when it's involved in a project as partner or if applicable as a contractor? Um, I think what we really want to look at um, is also the non-purely um, scientific aspects of the proposal, but really the, the part that could be red flags, the part that could really um, um, uh, uh, prevent uh, the research to really have patient benefit in the longer run. Um, so for example, we're looking at innovation management, so everything around exploitation strategies, 
innovation management strategies, liaison with industry, identifying the right stakeholders, particularly the SMEs um, that could collaborate uh, with the consortium. Uh, regulatory support, uh, which is uh, very important. And we have found that, that sometimes the expertise um, for regulatory uh, support may be missing in consortia. And then the third one is what we call translational optimization. So then AITRIS would come in, I would say, as a troubleshooter. So really monitoring the progress of the research project, making sure that all the barriers or all the, the, the go-no-go -go decisions are really looked after and ensuring that um, the project uh, translational potential is really optimized throughout the duration of the project. So this is more like a consulting type of role that we would have um, in the proposal. And then the fourth one um, is, is when Aatris comes in as a training provider. Um, I will have time to go into details, but, but of course there, there can be many topics that can be addressed in trainings as well. Um, just to, to summarize how you can use Aatris for your Transcan proposal, as I said, um, I think if you are struggling finding uh, the right partner, maybe specifically in a country, then, then we are there to help you. So what you can do is um, use this link that, that I put there in the slide or go on our dedicated page. And it's a very simple form that you can fill in, uh, giving us as much detail as you can on what you're looking for, because we have a very comprehensive overview of our institute's expertise. And then we'll get back to you with, uh, with matches. So potential institutes that have the expertise you're looking for with the contact information. Usually it's very quick. I would say two to three business days, you would have the, the information from us. And then it's up to you to decide which institution uh, you want to involve in your consortium and contact them and, and, and invite them to join. So that's, that's really the, the, the main aspect. And then the second one, as I said, because Netherlands and we are a Netherlands-based organization is not involved in Transcan 3. The only, um, the only way for Aatris to be involved directly in your proposal would be to join as a subcontractor. Uh, but then I would really invite you to check uh, eligibility criteria of your funder because not all funders usually allow subcontracting. And if they do, it's for very specific actions. Um, and for that aspect, um, I would really invite you to contact me directly. And then we can discuss the needs of your proposal and, and how AITRIS can, can potentially help you. Before I close, I also, I didn't want to go through this during the presentation. As you see, it's a very busy slide, but you'll have the copy of the slides. So these um, are just a, an overview of, of the expertise and services that we think are very relevant for your proposal. So that gives you an idea of the type of partners that AITRIS has in the infrastructure that could potentially be involved in your proposal. So I invite you to also take a look at this slide uh, after the event. And uh, before closing, I also wanted to thank our members. Um, we have 14 countries uh, supporting us um, uh, funding AITRIS activities with that whom it would not be possible uh, to carry out admission. And uh, I also invite you to stay in contact with us, follow us on social media, uh, subscribe to our newsletter to uh, to know a bit more about what we do. And of course, feel free to, to get in touch with me uh, for any questions you may have about consortium building or, or how we can support you directly in your proposal. Um, thank you very much again to the organizers for inviting me and I wish you all a very productive networking event. Thank you. Are there any specific questions for Eatsis? Uh, I'm not seeing any, but I would like to remind you all that apart from transcountry calls, there are also cancer research calls uh, in Horizon Europe uh, health um, clusters. Uh, there are upcoming calls. And of course, you can also um, make use of the AATRIS infrastructure and help in those calls as well. So thank you. Thanks a lot for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, before going into the break, I would like to ask one more question to Sylvia, because I, I don't know the exact answer for this. Uh, if in one consortium with four partners from four countries, one partner does not receive funding because the funding agency has exhausted its fund, uh, this leaves the consortium with only three partners from three countries with partners, will this 
Will this eliminate the whole consortium or will you allow to continue with only three partners? Uh, I don't know, depends on the project, I guess. Uh, no, because usually the decision is about the whole project. Uh, um, each funding organization uh, is uh, going to make every possible effort to increase the budget if uh, such a case uh, uh, is uh, would happen so but um, it, it cannot be changed the project consortium because uh, we consider that the project uh, once is uh, finalized uh, can be implemented with the, the consortium as uh, proposed so um, the, if there is no possibility to revise the project budget uh, or to induce the funding organization to increase the budget or to use the, the co-funding from the European Commission or to try to fund some internal agreement among the participant funding organization. There are several means that the coal steering committee um, can uh, several uh, instruments uh, that agreements uh, that the co steering committee can uh, put in place uh, before uh, excluding a proposal that is well uh, well ranked uh, and uh, will make every effort to fund uh, the higher number of proposals as possible. But uh, usually uh, we don't exclude the, the a proposal cannot be modified by cutting a part of it because there is no funding from one of the partners because its scientific integrity would be lost. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we go into a five minute coffee break or I don't know, uh, short break, and then we will continue with the pitching session. Thank you. Right.
Should we start? Um, I would like to invite Dr. Devrim Hassan Okur from Turkey uh, for her this presentation. Welcome. Hello. Let me share my screen. Do you see it now? Yes. And let me go to slideshow mode. Do you still see it? Yes, I would like to remind you that you have 10 minutes, including questions. So yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, our research. I am Devrin Pesanokur, professor at Izmir Institute of Technology. <clears throat> this is a state university established in 92. It focuses on higher education and research, and it is the only internationally distinguished <clears throat> technical university in Turkey. It is very active in research. And I joined East Tech in 2010. Our lab is called Controlled In Vitro Microenvironments Laboratory. We have uh, many uh, projects completed and ongoing. And our focus, as you'll see, is on organ on chips. I assume you can see the videos working. Yes. Great. And our team is currently uh, post consisting of postdoc graduate students and undergraduates. I would like to emphasize that the undergrads at our institute actually work like grad students and they provide significant input to our research output. We have collaborations with Unistec and also other uh, significant uh, universities in Turkey. We focus on organ on a chip devices and we want to mimic the tumor microenvironment and we want to understand how the microenvironment controls the metastatic process, in this case specifically in breast cancer, but we can also work with other types of cancer. And our work has also resulted in a startup company. We have patent applications and a US patent granted. We focus on the tissue specific invasion of cells, for example, how breast cancer spreads to lung and liver uh, and bone preferentially. So in terms of this call, our concept is to understand the role of the microenvironment, especially the immune cells, during the metastatic process, you know the aims of the project uh, call, which is aim one and two, and we are focusing on 1.1, 2.1, and 2.2. The idea is to mimic the microenvironment on these organ and chip devices that we develop and produce, and really understand how the microenvironment determines the outcome in patients. So besides having the organ on chip, we have worked with cell lines, but we want to really now work with patient samples. This can be liquid, solid, or uh, etc. And if there are clinical trials ongoing, we can complement the organ on chip work with the clinical trial and maybe prove that we can do clinical trials on these organ on chip devices. Of course, it would be good to have some uh, interest in the uh, drug delivery or discovery to actually understand how the drugs are gonna work before we actually test them on humans and to understand the cellular and molecular basis, omics would be an important part of the project. So as you have, I think it's clear by now that we are organ on chip uh, group, research group, we are also a company. And our priority is to combine our technology with patient samples and preferably clinical trials. Of course, immunology 
uh, expertise would be uh, beneficial to have. Drug discovery delivery and omics expertises are also sought after. And since our devices are transparent, if you can complement uh, spectroscopy techniques to uh, do the images, the omics data, uh, that would be really, really nice. And of course, image analysis, we are doing it, and but we can improve this, especially in uh, 3D. So um, I have given you a short overview of what we have done, and I would be happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any at the moment. OK, okay. then. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. you can always you can always contact uh, the presenters uh, via email. Thanks. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Bilan Soy from Turkey. Thank you very much. I am sharing my screen right away to not to lose time. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to present our work and talk about our project idea and uh, for giving us this networking event opportunity to uh, strengthen our uh, future consortia. My name is Eren Bilansoy and I'm a professor of pharmaceutical technology at Hacettepe University uh, Faculty of Pharmacy. Uh, Hacettepe University is located in Ankara um, and it's uh, one of the um, relatively younger state universities, mostly focused on, on medical sciences and life sciences. And as a department and as a research lab, we're uh, located in the medical campus of Ajetepe University, um, together with um, an oncology hospital, a cancer institute, a pediatric hospital, and also an adult hospital. So um, uh, this is a very active medical campus. And um, as a research lab and as a department, we're working as the drug delivery group and the formulation development and preclinical characterization group, actually. So what we're doing in our lab is uh, we're working on the preclinical research on mostly nanotechnological drug delivery systems of uh, chemotherapeutic molecules. These can be small molecules or macromolecules, um, as well as immunotherapeutics that are dedicated to cancer treatment and uh, tumor targeting uh, in focus. Um, our research team as Bilansoy Lab at the moment consists of uh, myself as well as three assistant professors and eight PhD students that are actively working on their uh, thesis projects as well as other projects. And uh, we have access to formulation development facilities, um, in vitro characterization, cell culture and three-dimensional tumor spheroid culture uh, techniques. Uh, we also actively um, incorporate proteomics and metabolomics based analysis um, to see the effects of the nanocarriers uh, on especially cancer cells. Um, we have access to animal facilities um, and we are um, also, um, I think we have decades of experience on pharmacokinetic and anti-tumoral activity, anti-metastatic activity experiences. We have recently also started working with the Cancer Institute on biodistribution studies of these nanoparticles um, after oral or injectable applications. And um, uh, so these are, uh, I think, our established um, skills uh, in terms of uh, cancer projects. So what we are doing uh, recently um, in terms of projects, um, I don't want to go into too much detail because of the time limitation, but we are mostly working on um, tumor targeted nanoparticles. Um, and we also want to um, incorporate omics technologies and printing technologies into these uh, innovative drug delivery systems, so to say. So our two recent projects are focusing on mitochondrial targeting in non-Hodgkin lymphoma uh, using rituximab uh, conjugated to a triple drug loaded nanoparticle. We also are working on cholesterol targeted nanoparticles to induce selective apoptosis in cancer cells. Um, in this project, we have experience in breast cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and non-small cell lung cancer. And we have very good results in terms of facilitating um, a drug delivery uh, into the cells, overcoming of drug resistance, as well as um, even without the drug, 
uh, disrupting the cell membrane and um, leading the cell to, to a selective apoptosis. Uh, we uh, are working on omics-based nanomedicine development. Uh, we're using the systems biology approach together with uh, colleagues from Department of Analytical Chemistry. Uh, one of the research projects that we're working on, which is now coming to the end, is immunotherapeutic nanoplexes uh, that we um, develop using a cationic polymer uh, complexed with uh, 5 fluorouracil and interleukin-2. And we are basically working on the preclinical evaluation in colon cancer uh, with uh, both um, IV and also oral application. And we're now at the animal studies stage of this. Um, we have worked um, in a European project on oral nanosponges for toxic molecule removal from biological fluids uh, for uh, chronic kidney disease uh, treatment. Um, we have completed projects on inkjet printed combination bioadhesive films for cervical cancer treatment. And we're now working on 3D printed intrauterine device for the controlled release of cisplatin and paclitaxel in uterine cancers. So um, for this call, um, our project idea is in line with, we think, AIM2. Uh, this is targeting the tumor microenvironment to improve efficacy of immunotherapy in human patients. And we think that sub-AIM2.1 is uh, in perfect alignment with, with our project idea, which is development of new precision therapeutic strategies that may prevent um, tumor recurrence or resistance. Uh, the tentative title of our project is Dual Drug Loaded Implantable Drug Delivery Device with Self-Healing Properties and Biphasic TME-Triggered Drug Release via Targeted Nanoparticles in Acute and Adjuvant Treatment of Breast Cancer. Um, our main objective can be summarized as mimicking the clinical first choice adjuvant treatment for breast cancer with a local breast implant that is able to release paclitaxel via triggering by TME elements, um, as well as long-term, which is up to five years release of uh, small dose tamoxifen uh, with layer by layer printing on the silicone implant surface. And what we expect as a result is drug eluting implant development, the biocompatibility data and personalized drug dosage and combination. And we want to avoid the side effects and the secondary cancer progression due to the uh, long-term oral tamoxifen administration to estrogen positive breast cancer patients. So um, visually, what we're trying to do is after the removal of the tumor from uh, the breast cancer patient, this removal can be partial or total. Um, if there's a partial removal, uh, then uh, the injectable uh, drug delivery system will be applied, uh, which will uh, then um, uh, change its uh, viscosity behavior and uh, become a reservoir at the injection site and then start releasing the drugs uh, in terms of um, external stimuli, uh, or we will actually uh, print patches on the silicone uh, breast implant that most of the patients receive, uh, so that um, if the, uh, the implant actually is able to detect uh, cancer cell progression or metastasis, uh, it will um, respond to this external stimuli by releasing the paclitaxel, encapsulated paclitaxel, and also we will have this layer by layer um, controlled release um, uh, area on the silicone implant, which will be able to release a long-term tamoxifen because most of these breast cancer patients actually have to receive oral tamoxifen tablets for at least five years. And this tamoxifen, uh, although preventive for breast cancer, is able to cause uh, endometrial or uterine cancers as a side effect. So, um, at the time being, uh, we, uh, we actually, we are a, a double team. We're working with uh, Slovak Academy of Sciences Polymer Institute uh, with uh, Dr. Heydari. He's also a participant in this event. Uh, we came up with this idea uh, and we want to work together in this consortium too. Uh, we're two academic partners from Turkey and Slovakia. So uh, Hacettepe University, our team will be uh, responsible for targeted nanoparticle development, in vivo evaluation of the anti-tumoral activity uh, in animal studies and the printing process. Uh, the Slovak Academy of Sciences Polymer Institute will work on the preparation of the bio-ink precursor, the polymeric IDDS development, slow-release IDDS development for tamoxifen and characterization of this 
uh, implantable drug delivery system. We also have a third partner uh, from Ex Marseille University. Uh, they're also academic from France, and they will be also working with uh, on a polymer um, controlled release layer that we can uh, try in our implants. So what we need for our consortium is uh, we definitely need some clinical input here. Uh, First of all, in terms of biocompatibility tests, because this will be a drug eluting implant, uh, it will be a drug eluting medical device. So the biocompatibility is very important uh, for both blank and drug eluting breast implants. So we need some clinical uh, or maybe an SME input on running these biocompatibility tests in vitro and in vivo. Uh, we may also uh, need uh, some uh, TME sensitive polymer synthesis, uh, and this could come from academic groups or SMEs uh, for the synthesis, synthesis of drug conjugated polymers that release drugs through triggering by tumor microenvironment factors. Um, also clinically, uh, from, from um, departments of oncology or immunology, I think that the safety assessment and the drug regimen adjustment is very important for this uh, implant, so we would need input on this. Uh, we also would need input on an introduction of immunotherapeutic aspect to this implant. And also, um, since we're uh, actively working on uh, 3D spheroid systems for breast cancer, uh, we would uh, uh, need uh, patient uh, biological samples to come up with uh, patient-derived organoid systems for the preclinical evaluation of the implant that we're working on. So um, this is what I will uh, tell you uh, in my, about my project right now. If you have any further questions, you can see my email and also our uh, research group website. And also, um, if you're interested, we can meet during the B2B session uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bilansoy. I think there's a Turkish partner uh, that wrote to you in the questions. Uh, yes, it is possible to have two partners from Turkey. Uh, I think I would like uh, if you could answer them by typing your answers, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, I will type. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Dr. Guandolin from Health Research Institute of the Balearic Islands, Spain. Thank you. Okay. Thank. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, I, I would like to sincerely thank the organizers for choosing my, my presentation to share um, with all of you um, our work and also um, the idea we have to prepare a, um, a project for this call. So I'm working in the... Um, I'm working in the in IDISBA, the Health Research Institute of the Balearic Island. This is a research institute and um, it actually is one of the 31 health research institutes in Spain. This means that we, um, uh, we were evaluated by, uh, by our funding agency and, um, and to be one of these institutes means uh, already conveys some, some uh, degree of, of, of quality. Uh, we have some experience in uh, international um, calls actually um, in, in different European and also uh, with uh, calls from the States and also we are collaborate with uh, Australia. And I would like to, to emphasize the very last one um, project that started in uh, this month and uh, actually it's an Eranet um, project and uh, uh, where um, we participate as um, collaborators. It's our first European uh, project funded. Uh, so that means that we already have as a group a little bit of experience in this kind of, of calls. Um, uh, regarding the group, I'm the, um, the group leader of lipids in human pathology. Uh, in our group, we have uh, in researchers from very different um, expertise, chemists, biochemists. Also, we have a great deal of medical doctors. Um, and uh, well, we have different, with dif different um, research interests. But um, if I have to, let's say our goal is to understand the role of um, membrane lipids in disease. Um, as you will see at the end of the, of the, of the presentations, uh, 
actually we could study many many different diseases and tissues but uh, from the beginning in uh, we started in 2015 i started uh, to work in colorectal cancer and uh, in the last years um, we have incorporated different um, researchers uh, pre-doctoral and also postdoctoral researchers uh, with a solid um, background in immunology so we started um, to investigate the changes in the lipidome in this kind of, of cells so just to give you a very, very short um, idea of what we are doing, what, what, or let's say what makes us a little bit different than other groups is that we are collaborating very tightly with the group in the Basque country. Um, and we analyze uh, tissue, the, the lipidome on uh, tissue sections. Um, we have already some uh, publications that I've, I've included all the reference at the end of the, of the talk. And, and for me, as a, as a, as a lipo lipidologist, one of the most surprising things was to observe and, and, and see on the, on the results how specific the lipidome was. And, um, and, uh, um, well, and the, the key result, what let's say is the, is the seed of this, um, of this project, was that uh, we could uh, we identify more than 30 uh, lipid species that were changing along the the, the column crypt. Uh, well, if you're not familiar, here we have the stem cells and they are slowly um, differentiating. And um, the amount of these lipids were changing according to a mathematical equation. So why this is important? Because um, the lipids are considered like, uh, well, it doesn't matter which kind of lipids we have. Um, a little bit of phosphatidylcholine, etc., and we make uh, all the membranes are the same. But uh, in these results, we show that no, that uh, it's very specific and that it's very, very regulated. So when something is very, re uh, very regulated, means that it can be unregulated, and this is the the story. Uh, currently, we are uh, combining lipidomic data with transcriptomic using Wagner analysis. Uh, and this will help us to understand um, which of the lipid enzymes are involved in these processes, because there is a big uh, gap in knowledge uh, regarding the, the role of lipid uh, enzymes. Um, I think it's important to say that we, we work mainly with human samples and we are uh, already in developing uh, and, and we are getting more experience in, in growing the human um, colon organoids from both healthy and also tumoral. And um, as I mentioned, uh, our one of the uh, last recent lines is focus is uh, on the changes in the lipidome occurring in circulating and infiltrated immune cells in CRC page, patients. So basically what we do is uh, by sorting, we can isolate different immune cells and we do it from blood, but also from the um, from tumor. Uh, these cells, then uh, we can um, play them on on, on regular uh, glass slides, and we analyze the lipidome. And uh, we all have already solid data showing that, uh, as we expected, there are changes between hum uh, between healthy and patients with colorectal cancer, um, and um, then. In addition to this analysis, we also um, analyze the, um, the tumor infiltrate um, directly with the MALDI. So the idea we, uh, behind all of this is to be able to, to really uh, localize those pixels. Because I didn't say, but we can this almost we are reaching the cellular uh, resolution level. So we can identify which of these pixels belong to each of the types of uh, immune cells uh, infiltrated and also uh, if they are activated or not. So this is our big goal. So um, the concept, because the title is not even, maybe it's not even the, the tentative uh, title, but the concept is that we want to uh, make a multi-omic approach, but paying especially attention and on the lipidome, because we think that this, it can it is one of the of the biomolecules that can give really the um, a lot of information, new information that uh, currently is not taken into account. So uh, our idea fits perfectly with the aim one and, and with sub aims one and uh, one point one and one point two. And basically, what we will do 
is to focus on two of the um, CMS uh, um, um, molecular subtypes of, of colorectal cancer, which were in which the immune um, the immune system plays, uh, according to the the, the literature, the, the way is more important. So the idea or the objectives are to this to take this multiomic um, approach. Uh, we would say, uh, sequence the genome of or of each type of tumor that we, we obtain. Um, we will do lipid, um, lipid analysis, um, imaging mass spectrometry at two levels, um, because uh, we, first we, will have, we would like to have a very uh, thorough picture, and very uh, accurate, and then we will try to validate uh, using a benchtop uh, equipment because one of the aims of the of this project is to be able to really uh, adopt this technique in a, in the clinical um, daily routine. And this data, this lipidome data, will be combined with a spatial uh, gene expression uh, analysis, with single cell uh, RNA sequencing analysis, and also with um, um, imaging mass spectrometry to establish a proteome. So. One of the most important things of the project will be to integrate all this type of um, omic data together with the clinical data using system biology approaches um, to improve the um, tumor microenvironment uh, subclass uh, definition. So we really think that lipids uh, have something to say to, this, to the subclasses that can be established by uh, transcriptomic analysis or genomic analysis. And then I think it will be a little bit too much, but. Um, depending also the, on the type of, of um, partners that we are able to, to, to, to integrate in the project. But of course, if we characterize very well all these aspects, we will have a lot of information regarding the cells and the kind of, of interactions. And we could think about uh, using our organoids or um, uh, mouse models to, to, to, to, to study these interactions. So the expected results um, would be to obtain these detailed features at the cellular level and at the molecular um, level. Then uh, we think that we will be able to identify new and solid targets, especially because we will pay attention on these um, lipid enzymes. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, for us will be very important to, to come up with an IMS uh, protocol using a more um, simple device that is that will be uh, reasonable to to to adopt in a, in a hospital you know, because we're doing, it's very difficult to to plan to have a one million euros equipment, but uh, something more simple but can give you the the same information or the relevant information. And currently, I'm looking for for partners. Uh, we might have one um, one partner from from Poland uh, that would take care of the spatial proteome. And as what we need is uh, we need partners that would take care of the single cell analysis. Also, um, and this is very important, um, a, solid, a group uh, with experience in system biology analysis, and then the uh, clinic, clinical group uh, that would take care of, of all the, the, the clinical data to do it properly, all the opinion of uh, with MDs and, and oncologists. And, uh, and also to help to have uh, more patients. We, we are able to recruit patients and actually it's something that we are doing on a regular basis, but it would be very interesting to have more patients from different countries. So with this, I leave you my last slide where you can see my contact uh, information, also our website and our publications on uh, imaging mass spectrometry. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think you have an interested researcher in the questions box. So if you could type your answer from there. Okay, I will be glad to do it. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So now I would like to invite Mr. Miguel Moreno from Optus Biotech, Spain. Welcome. Hello, Hello good morning, everyone. Let me, um, it's working already? Yes. yes, yes. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, let me, yeah, perfect. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the, uh, the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this event. Um, here today, I would like to present how Atamers could help in, in this kind of projects in immunotherapy of cancer. 
first of all, let me introduce a little bit the, the, the company. Uh, as uh, Aptus Biotech is a consolidated uh, biotech company founded in Spain as a startup of the group of aptamers in the hospital Ramonica Hall uh, 10 years ago. Our main goal is the generation of value through the development of novel diagnostic and therapeutic application, always based on the aptamer technology. Uh, Aptus Biotech know-how has been developed along the last 20 years by our scientific team. And we are already consolidated in the national market as a reference company in the Atomer technology uh, uh, because of the, the technology has been applied in different projects with a lot of different clients and, and with uh, a lot of good results. Um, let me explain to you a little bit the, the, the Atomer technology. What are Atomers? Atomers are single standard nucleic acids with a typical length from 15 to 100 nucleotides and a molecular weight around 70 to 80 kilodots. Typically, uh, uh, an astamer is has uh, two known regions of nucleotides that are used in, in priming uh, for the uh, PCR amplifications and a central region with a number of uh, random nucleotides in this example with 40 nucleotides, uh, uh, which means around 10 to 30 theoretical combinations. It means a lot of these molecules to, uh, uh, to select from, from and, and to start a, a selecting process. Aptamers um, uh, are capable of binding to specific target molecules due to the acquisition of a stable 3D structure based on their sequence and the, the environment, uh, which means the, the, the ionic strength, pH, temperature, etc. With that stable three-dimensional structure, they are able to bind to a target molecule in the same way or very similar way that antibody to, uh, uh, um, to the target molecules. How are uh, aptamers selected? Aptamers are selected in vitro depending on the specificity of binding with a particular target from millions of random uh, sequences. Uh, imagine a theoretical combination of 10 to 30, which is a lot of molecules and, and probably impossible to synthesize, but we usually synthesize 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 14 uh, different uh, molecules. So we start with a random library of a lot of molecules in order to get the best binder to our target molecules. Uh, from eight to 16 uh, select cycles, we obtain finally a TAMERS candidate. Um, a TAMERS candidate could be uh, similar to monoclonal, aptimers, uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, sorry. So a uh, population of the TAMERS that are selected means something similar to polyclonal antibodies and the uh, TAMERS candidates finally are monoclonal. Uh, uh, aptamers like monoclonal antibodies. So, what okay. Can, sorry. Uh, okay. So, aptamers uh, uh, can bind to a multiple types of targets, uh, in small organic or inorganic molecules, nucleotides, amino acids, antibiotics, nucleic acids. Uh, they can bind to different structures of nucleic acids not only by binding like a um, uh, hybridization, but also trying to uh, differentiate uh, the, the finite dimensional structure of a nucleic acid. They can bind to peptides, proteins, membranes, cells, or we can select even against whole organisms like a virus. The most important thing in, in this case is that we can apply the cell technology, the selection of the aptamers to a lot of different targets that in somehow could be difficult to, uh, to obtain uh, antibodies. So we obtain high specificity uh, uh, binders. We even the possibility of uh, uh, make uh, counter selections that allows to discriminate even the uh, presence or absence of uh, small groups like methyl or hydroxyl groups, or even differences between D and L and antiomers. But also the aptamers could be of very high affinity uh, because we can improve the astringency of the, of the selection process in order to obtain higher and higher affinity uh, binders. 
So in, uh, at this point, obviously, uh, most of the people think about aptamers and the difference with the uh, antibodies. Is there any difference? Well, the main difference, obviously, is that antibodies are proteins and, and aptamers are nucleic acid, single stranded nucleic acid. Aptamers are identified through the in vitro selection process that is called SELEX, which selection conditions can be manipulated in order to obtain aptamers stable in a wide range of environmental uh, conditions. So not only in physiological conditions, but we can obtain uh, aptamers against any kind of uh, environmental condition. Okay. So, and very importantly, aptamers may be obtained against non-immunogenetic uh, proteins or toxins. Uh, imagine obtaining, uh, obtaining um, uh, antibodies against small uh, molecules or small or non-immunogenic uh, proteins or toxins is uh, some, uh, sometimes it's very difficult. With aptamers, we have the possibility to obtain them more easier or easier, sorry. So at the end, aptamers are produced by chemical synthesis. So they have little or no batch uh, to batch variation. Aptamers can be modified with uh, even to increase their stability in, in order to uh, uh, go through the uh, uh, body fluids like uh, in blood, we can improve their stability. We can use also reported molecules that can be attached to aptamers at precise locations, not involving binding. So we can uh, have aptamers with fluorescence, for instance, fluorescence tags, and we can follow the, the, the aptamers within the, the, the body, or even attach uh, any other kind of drugs, nanoparticles, whatever. Very importantly, they can be amplified by PCR, so they can be very easily detected in, in, in, in the body. Also, the natural aptamers can be regenerated with immunes. We mean, uh, the have three minutes left. Can you uh, be quicker? Okay, sorry. So, uh, very importantly, they are non immunogenic, uh, they're stable, and they're very small. So, uh, our, our business model, very easy, to, very quick. They, uh, uh, we are uh, working in, in, in aptamer customer services. That means we have a lot of clients uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with a lot of different projects. We are working uh, with them. Also, we have our own research and development programs. Uh, this is our, our main sex uh, uh, uh, product, which is an aptamer targeting TLR4, uh, which is already in clinical phase 2A and having licenses to after target. Uh, this is our main program uh, right now, is Aptabris, uh, it's a new therapeutic uh, target in, in breast cancer. Uh, uh, and we are in the preclinical pre uh, trials right now. And we have seen that reduce the tumor size in animal models, uh, separate fluorescence, and number of metastases. Um, uh, just a little finish, the, the project idea that we, can, we would like to share here with you is that Current approaches to immunotherapy are also accompanied by significant immune, immune toxicities. So to address this challenge, we may specifically deliver immune therapeutics to the target tumors, as you all know better than me. That we offer is that atomers can bind to receptors on cell membranes and mediate them themselves or conjugated to nanoparticles to enter into the cells. So atomers can be served as, ideal, as an ideal mediated drug delivery system for cancer therapy. So here we offer our Atamer technology as a platform to generate uh, novel tools uh, to improve uh, immunotherapy efficacy. So uh, here is our, our scientific team with more than 20 years working in, in Atamers, uh, based in the in the IDC's Atamer group, uh, led by Victor Gonzalez uh, and uh, Elena Martin, like a scientific officer of the company. So that's all, and thank you very much, everybody, for, for listening. Uh, and I hope you're interested in, in the Atamer uh, technology. Thank you very much, that's all. Thank you. You have a question in the question box. If you could type it, we would be glad. Can the Atamer also be generated? Uh, that could you type it? I will uh, invite the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. 
Now I would like to invite Dr. Ricardo Neves from Center for Neuroscience and Cell Biology, Portugal. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. Um, I will try to share my screen. Okay, so you, you have my screen, right? Yes, yes thank you. Okay, so good morning. Um, my name is uh, uh, Ricard Neves. I work at the Center for Neuroscience and Cell Biology uh, in Portugal, and it uh, specifically in the biotech branch of it. Um, so this is a, a non-profit organization uh, that has a good record of scientific ex excellence and uh, internationalization. And in the last decade, it has made a shift towards a more translational field with its partnerships with hospitals and the creation of a, a biotechnology park. Uh, it's very success, successful in getting international competitive funding uh, and also in the, in the pharma world. In this uh, hexagonal scheme, you can find some of the research interests uh, of the innovative therapies unit, which include the blood reprogramming and hematopoietic reconstitution. Uh, with the basic concept of uh, stem cell modulation uh, using uh, biomaterials and nanotechnology uh, approaches to, to, to fight disease. So the biomaterials and stem cell based therapeutics group uh, is interested in developing biomaterials and bioengineering platforms uh, for the efficient uh, maturation and specification of stem cells and their uh, progenies. Uh, the research group uses many tools to accomplish this goal, including the design of uh, new biomaterials with the relevant biological information, uh, also molecular and cell biology, microfluidic systems, high content analysis, and also animal uh, experimentation. We have a wide uh, spectrum of nanotechnologies that are uh, very promising for the study of stem, stem cell niches and also to control uh, exogenous and endogenous stem cells once they are uh, in, uh, uh, the exogenous, once they are um, inside the body. Our group is particularly interested to use these tools to induce uh, in vivo cell reprogramming and to mobilize stem cells from their niches uh, to treat uh, disease. For this purpose, we are developing nanomaterials that are very efficient in releasing the small molecules. Uh, proteins, drugs, and, and non-coding RNAs that are able to manipulate uh, the niche uh, microenvironment. Uh, one of our research interests is to reprogram cell microenvironments, and uh, we believe that uh, we can do better if uh, we increase the concentration uh, and the time that the nanoformulation that carries the active principle uh, stays inside the cell, and in this case, um, is, it is important uh, that the nanoparticles escape the endosomal system. Uh, also, if we use uh, the natural tropism of cells for specific niches, we can load these cells with nanoparticles, and we, we can then remotely activate the release of uh, the chemotherapeutic agent by an external uh, stimulus. Um, in this context, we have developed a uh, photoactivatable, well, several, a portfolio of uh, photoactivatable nanoformulations that is able to release, uh, that are able to release retinoic acid inside the leukemic niche and reduce the disease burden in uh, leukemia animal models. So at the preclinical pre level, we have this validated. We load the cells with nanoparticles carrying retinoic acid and we use the cell's natural uh, tropism towards the niche. And once they are there, we can photoactivate the release and have a differentiation effect inside the niche. So we are exploring how this impacts on the disease. And we are submitting a paper now where we see an increase in uh, anti-tumor macrophages, both in the site of activation, but also in non-irradiated uh, niches. So we are exploring what is the, the reason for this um, for this abscopal effect. So uh, not uh, in the irradiated niche, but also uh, in the long bones and, and in other niches, we, we are seeing this effect. We are collaborating with uh, Christina Lo Celso's lab at Imperial College in London, which are experts in uh, intravital imaging. 
uh, you can see, I hope you can see a movie where you see macrophages moving inside the, the hematopoietic niche or the leukemic niche. And we already have um, a microscope infrastructure to do intravital uh, microscopy in Coimbra. And uh, we are setting up the intravital microscopy protocols uh, in Coimbra with the help of uh, Cristina. So with respect to ideas for this call, we would like to tackle resistant leukemias and it identify new molecules that we could deliver through our nanoparticle portfolio and that could be um, improving immunotherapy applications. We'll, we are particularly in the con context of uh, resistant uh, acute myeloid leukemias. We believe that our retinoic acid uh, nanoformulation could be considered for a coadjuvant immunotherapy using uh, CAR-T or NK cells. We believe that our expertise is a perfect fit in this call dedicated to the tumor microenvironment. And we are looking for partners in the fields of single cell omics, immunology and production of CAR T cells and NK cells, where we believe we can make a, a difference with our uh, platform um, for uh, coadjuvant strategy uh, in terms of immunotherapy. And we envision that we could take this uh, a step further to the clinic if uh, we find a partner with the GMP HSC transplant capabilities. Uh, maybe we could uh, we could take this a step further. Uh, having said this, we are also available to to integrate a, a consortium that uh, may be interested in our nanoformulation uh, expertise for a different uh, disease or or idea. And uh, this is my contact details, and uh, I will take some questions if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Namesh. Um, at the moment, I'm not seeing any questions, but uh, participants can always uh, contact you by, by email as well. Uh, and I would like to remind all the participants that uh, the presentations will be uploaded uh, to the system, be to match system, if the presenters allow it, so you will be able to um, access the presentations afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now I would like to invite uh, Ms. Tetiana Petroskova from Audubon Bioscience. Good day, everyone. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. All right, thank you. So good day, everyone. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to present at the networking meeting. Um, uh, I am a director of the biomedical research at Audubon Bioscience. And in the title slide, I would also like to share with you uh, my uh, colleagues who will be working with us on, um, on the project that we propose for the TransCan. Audubon Bioscience, um, we are an innovative provider of biospecimal solution services and uh, related biomedical information. Uh, and our goal is uh, the world where cancer is early detected and effectively treated. Uh, and to do that, firstly, we provide biospecimen solutions and services to precision medicine researchers uh, because we would like to support discovery of the new therapeutics and diagnostics. And for that, we have a wide variety of biospecimens such as tissues and uh, blood and biofluid cells. Uh, we have extensive clinical data and follow-up information, which is always important in creating the demographics uh, the, the demographics database um, in the cancer-related research. We have various types of laboratory services as we are partnering with multiple clinical sites and different laboratories. And of course, we um, guarantee our um, quality and services. Um, as I said, we have um, multiple sites and many collaborators, uh, and they're all over the globe. 
in the United States, Europe, Asia, Africa. And particularly for this project, uh, we are um, going to work with, um, at this moment, we're partnering with uh, Turkey, Hungary, and Romania, uh, with uh, multiple, with several universities um, in Turkey, with medical oncology department and hematology department, uh, with uh, the hospitals uh, in Hungary. So this would be the Kapashi Moore Hospital in Hungary um, and um, the uh, um, also the uh, County Central Hospital in Hungary uh, and in Romania that is the Fendani Clinical Institute and Marius Nasta uh, Pneumophysiology Institute. The countries that are listed in TransCan but we would actively uh, be willing to um, include them in our research are Ukraine, Georgia, Nigeria, Ghana, Moldova, and United States. Our goal is to combine our capacities with other research teams to develop new and uh, improve existive, uh, existing predictive liquid biopsy cancer biomarkers. And for that, we would like to use cell-free circulating tumor DNA, CFDNA, and prognostic biomarkers for immunotherapy using PBMCs. We would also like to consider uh, discovering and developing AI models to analyze the data and make predictions of outcomes to test their validity. Um, our emphasis that we would like to make, especially in uh, conjoinment with the countries that are not listed in TransCan, uh, is including underrepresented ethnic groups from developing countries. So we would like to um, use the um, we would like to use the data from patients from underrepresented countries, and we would like to diversify the study cohorts. Uh, and this is very important step, as we believe, for improving cancer screening and treatment treatment um, in the case of especially immunotherapies that are not rapidly available in developing countries at this moment. Um, and we would like to um, help those groups and help those populations with uh, to promote new cancer diagnostics and treatments. Moving forward to our project idea and the concept that we would like to propose. Uh, first, regarding AIM-1, uh, we would like to use the plasma cell-free DNA uh, parameters as the potential predictive cancer biomarker uh, on a population-based approach. Uh, so we would like to use the cell-free DNA isolated from uh, plasma, uh, and we would like to um, provide insight into cancer progression uh, pre- and post-treatment, uh, and also trying to um, use this data in identification of any residual cancer cells. Um, and our expected results would be to see different parameters for the CFDNA in patients before and after uh, cancer treatment. And we would also um, see the correlation between the cell-free DNA parameters and expression levels to the known tumor biomarkers. And this way, we would like to bring the uh, liquid biopsy a step forward uh, and use it instead of the regular biopsies. As for the AIM-2, uh, we um, have a similar uh, project that we would like to address, and that would be liquid biopsy prognostic biomarkers for cancer immunotherapy outcomes. Uh, for that, we would also like to include different populations in our study, and we would like to determine the changes in expression of the immune biomarkers found on uh, PBMCs. And for that, we would like to create the um, uh, expression data profile, immune profile of the PBMCs, and we would like to propose new prognostic markers for immunotherapy um, of cancer patients. Patients. We would also like to uh, train and test the uh, artificial intelligence model uh, to predict immunotherapy outcomes uh, using the collected data um, and observed real-time scenarios and, and outcomes. For the AI idea, we would like to uh, create uh, and find complex models that would combine uh, multiple data sets, um, such as uh, liquid biopsy biomarkers, NGS, um, imaging uh, that would um, give us a more complex um, 
uh, options and more complex models to the existing ones. In our expected results, we expect to identify expression dynamics um, in the immune biomarkers uh, upon immunotherapy progression. Uh, and also we expect to see some variability um, depending on population that we will be studying. Um, and uh, we would like to um, establish a reliable and non-invasive method to predict immunotherapy responsiveness for um, cancer patients. Um, as for the partners, uh, currently we have multiple research groups that are um, concentrated on enrollment of relevant patients, collecting and processing biosamples, uh, and performing the basic laboratory testing and processing. Uh, we also have the Audubon Bioinformatics uh, Department that would be applying IA models. However, we are very much interested in um, expanding our group and collaborating with more partners uh, for the basic research uh, consultation, translation research consultation, uh, bioinformaticians, and experts in um, artificial intelligence. So with that, I would like to thank you um, again for the time. And if you have any uh, questions, um, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petroskova. Um, I think you have some um, potential collaborators in the questions and answers box. If you could uh, answer them there, we would be glad. And now I would like to invite Dr. Isabel Ge uh, from University Hospital Freiburg, Germany. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present our ideas here at the International Networking Event. I will be representing Professor Dr. Talia Erbes today to um, deliver this presentation since she has a scheduling conflict this morning for the afternoon meeting. She is going to join us later. Well, who are we? We are the Laboratory of Molecular Oncology under the PI of Professor Dr. Talia Erbes, and we're part of the Department for Gynecology and Obstetrics at the Freiburg University Medical Center. This is located in Germany, um, where Professor Erbes is the head of the Breast Cancer Center. Um, she is a gynecological oncologist, a gynecological oncologist surgeon, and also head of this laboratory where we focus on translation, translational research on molecular biological development and validation of especially liquid biomarkers in diagnostics and therapy monitoring of breast and gynecological carcinomas, as well as tumor relevant drug analysis in vitro. Um, our special field of interest are microRNAs. What are microRNAs? These are short, stable, non-coding RNAs, which regulate post-transcriptional gene expression. And it's estimated that 30% of all genes are regulated directly through microRNAs. As of now, 2,500 human microRNAs are identified. MicronRNAs have the possibility to either promote or um, suppress cancer um, development and thus can be used as a biomarker. And similar to, for example, circulating tumor DNAs, you can also find microRNAs circulating in the body. Cells which um, can produce exosomes and excrete them into the, um, the surroundings, into the intercellular space. And thus we can find microRNAs in different type of fluids for example, blood, but also in urine, colostrum, peritoneal fluids, tear saliva, cerebrospinal fluids. What have we done so far? Um, we are specialized in um, analyzing microRNAs as a liquid biopsy for either cancer detection, but also for prediction of um, cancer therapy. In 2015, we have detected four urinary microRNAs which detect breast cancer with a sensitivity and specificity of over 80% and have thus obtained uh, a patent. Now, five years later, we have enhanced our um, study and um, with a detection rate of nearly 100% and have currently a patent uh, pending. 
And due to our promising results, we have also received a grant from the Federal Ministry for Education and Research of Germany with over 1.5 million euros to validate our results on breast cancer detection. Now, for Transcan 3, we would like to target the AIM 1.3 and 2.2. It's the development of tools capable of predicting treatment efficacy and evaluation in translational studies of the impact of the TME on treatment efficacy. Um, our project idea is the investigation of a specific microRNA signature of the tumor microenvironment as a predictive biomarker for immunotherapy. We would like to develop a robust non-invasive biomarker for the prediction, especially for the prediction of a therapy response to immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are used very widely in different kinds of tumors. The specimen that we're going to use are urine, blood, and tissue. And um, unlike before, we won't limit ourselves to gynecological or breast cancer only, but would like to do a basket design since a lot of tumor entities um, employ immunotherapy. The study will be performed retrospectively and prospectively, both as possible, by either evaluating patient data that already are existent or their outcome after receiving um, this medication. Our expected results is to find a specific microRNA signature, either in tissue or liquid biopsy, to predict the individual therapy response, which can also give us a rational, maybe for further development of microRNA targeting drugs in the future. This is a simple image of what we're going to do. As I said before, our study population are going to be cancer patients receiving immunotherapy, either they're responders or non-responders. From almost all of these patients, we already have tissue samples in our pathology um, department, which are analyzed, analyzed on the basic immuno-oncology um, panels, for example, with their PDL1 and PD1 status, TILS amount, etc. And additionally to the tissue samples that we already have, we would like to collect urine and blood samples and analyze the microRNA signature and see if there is any correlation between microRNA and the tumor microenvironment. To achieve this, we have a five pillars approach, which consists of preclinical research with cell culture experiments, in vivo experiments, and also the biomarker screening in tissue analysis, blood and urine analysis, and the last part in microRNA targeting. And we would like to um, have three different arms of patient collectives, the ones who are responding to immunotherapy, the non-responders, but also the patients who don't receive any immunotherapy at all. Um, here I've listed the steps we're going to follow, what we're going to do first and further. And finally, everything in red are the um, fields where we'd love to have a cooperation. Um, as a first step, like I said before, we would like to identify TME components and a microRNA signature, establish candidate microRNAs, and find molecular pathways with which we need cell culture experiments, preclinical research, and the tissue samples, which are already available uh, at our pathology. And for further steps are the sample collections. Since we have a lot of experience in urine, we would love to have um, a partner who is specialized in other um, bodily fluids, for example, blood. And then the final steps, we would like to take it to the translational approach, validation of the microRNAs that we found in a larger population and also maybe um, develop an easy application to use for clinical routine. And last but not least, the therapeutic targeting. Um, I've summarized everything for our required partner on this last uh, slide. As um, the organizers have said before, you can download the slide from our webpage. If you feel that you fit in any kind of these categories, feel free to contact us either through this um, event or by our contact address. This is um, the email of Professor Dr. Thaler Erbes directly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think you have some potential collaborators in the comments as well. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Ricardo, you also have a potential collaborator there. Uh, and of course, you can also network um, in the afternoon via the B2B, uh, B2Max platform as well. Thank you.
Um, now I would like to invite our last uh, PITS presenter, Dr. Romero uh, from the Health Research Institute, Spain. Okay. Dr. Romero, we Hi, can... everyone. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, um, letting us present uh, you uh, our research. Uh, so I am Atocha Romero. I work at Hospital Puerta de Hierro. This is a public hospital in Spain, in Madrid. This is, of course, it's a non-profit uh, organization. Our hospital is a, a hospital of first level. We have a, a medical oncology departments with uh, specialized areas. We have a, a translational unit, a clinical research unit, and we have an extensive uh, experience in clinical research and also in translational research. Uh, I am um, the person that uh, I, I, I, I am the head of the liquid biopsy lab, uh, which is a laboratory at the medical oncology department. And basically, this laboratory uh, offers a non invasive uh, biomarker testing for in patients and out patients uh, of the hospital. Uh, we are uh, certified by ISO uh, 15189, and we participate in as a reference laboratory in many clinical trials conducted by the, by the Spanish lung cancer group, uh, analyzing plasma samples, but also uh, tumor samples. Uh, we as a group have participated and have received uh, funding from the H2020 program. Uh, we have been participating in IESIS, big medalities. We are the leaders of the project Priority 5 and also um, it's project P4 Lucat. Uh, so we would like to uh, work within the area of AIM-1, identification and validation of tumor microenvironments in classes and their contributing to persistent mechanisms. Uh, we, we have a lot of experience uh, in the treatment uh, of lung cancer patients with immunotherapy, and the proposed uh, title for our project is Predictive Biomarker Test for Chemo Immunotherapy in Operable uh, Non-Small Cell Lung Cancers. One of our major achievements in the group uh, is that we have established that uh, immunotherapy plus uh, chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant settings, uh, it's very efficient. Uh, and uh, so we recently published in Lancet Oncology this paper in which pay, uh, the NADIM clinical trial and results were uh, that at 24 months, 77% uh, 70, of the patients were, PP were alive and with no progression, and 90% of the patients were alive. This is uh, pathological response were 63%, and this is uh, outstanding results and will change the, um, the standard of care for operable uh, uh, lung cancer. And so uh, this, uh, in the view of our funding, uh, a stage three uh, disease of non-small cell lung cancer is changing from a lethal disease for, uh, to a curable disease. And now uh, this is a new scenario that opens uh, new questions because these, uh, these patients uh, were um, in before only with chemotherapy, only 10% of the patients uh, or 20% uh, of the patients are alive after uh, four or five months and we four or five years, sorry. And uh, we know now that we can cure uh, not, not maybe all of these patients, but uh, a huge proportion of these patients. And so, so we need to offer the oncologist new uh, tools so that they can identify those patients that are at high risk and those patients that are at low risk and which patients we can cure, which patients we cannot. It is important, important to mention that the median age of diagnosis of lung cancer is 65 years old and that lung cancer surgery uh, is uh, lethal uh, for between 5% of the patients. So not all patients can go surgery. This is a treatment that is uh, received before uh, surgery and the intention is to reduce uh, the tumor in these subset of patients and uh, uh, and so that the patients can undergo a surgery and then uh, be treated with another adjuvant therapy and finally if uh, be cured. So as I mentioned, we are shifting the paradigm from a lethal disease to a curable disease in a stage three non-small cell lung cancer operable disease. We have many clinical trials ongoing. This is 
our portfolio. So results that we uh, obtain from mole molecular biomarkers that we identify, we can validate them in different uh, clinical trials. These are only clinical trials that are related with immunotherapy. Uh, we have uh, also many clinical trials ongoing with uh, uh, targeted therapies and so on, but we are now focused for this uh, transcan uh, in immunotherapy treatments. Uh, for all the clinical trials, we collect many samples. We collect um, blood, we collect, uh, we want to win to analyze uh, uh, lymphocytes, we would like to analyze circulating tumor DNA. We also are collecting the stools to analyze microbiome. And our approach is to identify and analyze as much as possible biomarkers. And for all these trials, all these studies has been approved. And for many of these trials, we have been collecting all these all these samples that we already have uh, at our laboratory. Uh, one of the uh, important things is that uh, now that we know we may uh, be able to cure some of these patients that uh, uh, before we couldn't, uh, we need to measure circulating tumor DNA at very low fractions because it is uh, so we will be, we need to, uh, we need uh, very sensitive techniques and very uh, other different bioinformatic pipelines to analyze circulating tumor DNA in patients that they might be cured. So we need to distinguish from patients that have response and that has, uh, you know, from all the patients that have response uh, to uh, chemo immunotherapy, which of them are really cured and which of them uh, might uh, relapse or progress. But in the, at the situation that we want to measure the circulating tumor DNA, it is presumable that there will be very, very low levels. So we need very uh, potent uh, NGS platforms. And uh, for that also, we need novel bioinformatic pipelines specifically designed for this. And we also uh, know that probably for, in order to distinguish those patients that will at the end uh, relapse and those patients that will not, we need also to analyze um, the immune, immune system and the relationship with the immune system. So basically, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, all the samples that we have are um, samples that are collected in the context of clinical trials where the clinical data has been very carefully collected. The samples have been collected at the same moments in the same patients. So this is uh, uh, a unique opportunity to analyze samples uh, with a very, very high quality. And so that it, it's very informative in terms of data because the uh, homogeneity of the, the data set that we have. Uh, in the context of Nadine clinical trials, we and we also are, are now are conducting the Nadine 2 clinical trial, we want to develop an optimized assay for ex with estacional sensitivity and specificity to detect minimal residual disease after chemoimmunotherapy. We also want to evaluate the tumoral heterogeneity and clonal evolution during a, a chemo, a chemotherapy, neoadjuvant treatment with chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So we want to know which mutations arose uh, uh, after a treatment pressure. So to understand which profiles or uh, mutations genes are underlying uh, tumor resistance. We want also to discover uh, T cells biomarkers and to characterize T cells uh, to know which uh, populations or clones uh, may uh, identify those patients doing uh, good response and those that finally will relapse. And also, and with all this data, we want to uh, develop a path and certification tool so that clinicians can discern which patients have the highest probability to be cured and which uh, patients will not have uh, with are at high risk of relapse in which patient we need to be more aggressive in the adjuvants after surgery or in which patients we can be more uh, less aggressive but without uh, limiting their their survival and quality of life uh, we also want to integrate um, imaging data uh, for Nadine one, we are already uh, working with Sophia Genetic. We have a strong collaboration with them. So, and we have all the uh, uh, NGS uh, data uh, already available. And we are combining uh, imaging data, clinical data, biological data, molecular data, uh, all together in order to develop uh, predictors uh, 
uh, using uh, big data analytics and uh, intelligence uh, methods. So at the end, our goals is to uh, develop tools that accurately predict the prognosis of the patient so that the uh, oncologist can uh, make a more uh, precise decisions and can tailor subsequent uh, treatments according to patient risks. Uh, so we want to uh, really identify and quantify the patient's risks of uh, relapsing after this treatment. Detection of early, early detection of molecular resistance is also important for us so as, as we are and the early we detect the resistance, the early we can uh, treat the patients. Uh, and, and so uh, we know that, that this is, uh, we will manage uh, more efficiently the, the disease. And also we want to identify patients that will have longer to buy band that gets will benefit from this treatment that are, of course are very expensive and they also have uh, side effects. So uh, that, those are the main idea. And for that, as I mentioned, we have uh, the best scenario possible, which are uh, clinical samples collected in clinical uh, trials with very homogeneous ambient, and uh, so that we produce uh, high quality data. Uh, so what we are looking for, we are looking for bioinformatics and biostatistics. Uh, uh, regarding biostatistics, we need uh, um, statisticians that are uh, uh, the know uh, about clinical trials and how to uh, derive conclusions from clinical trial data. Uh, we would like a, someone experienced in R and Stata, which are the, the, the software that we usually use. And uh, yeah, of course, a capacity to work with large data sets because we have many clinical data, imaging data, biological data, and uh, so on. And we also need some uh, bioinformaticians uh, we're experiencing NGS data and RNA seq. Uh, the aim is to discover um, intestinal signatures that can predict response to this treatment using supervisor and supervised analysis. Uh, ideally, we would like some bioinformaticians with experience in the field of liquid biopsy uh, because there are some uh, peculiarities for these uh, NGS panels, like uh, the a use of uh, unique molecular identifiers and so on. And so uh, that's where we are looking for. And uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your time. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, I am not seeing any questions for you at the moment, but um, participants can also contact you via email and I would like to remind all participants that they can still book their uh, networking events, face-to-face -face, um, meetings via the B2 Match platform uh, for the afternoon. Uh, the bookings are still open. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for their excellent presentations. And I am looking forward to seeing all the applications to the Transcon call. Um, I hope you will also benefit from the networking event uh, in the afternoon. Uh, I would like to close this session uh, if no one has uh, any other questions or comments. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ricardo, I think you answered the question. Um, so they would like to book a meeting for another time, I think. Um, thank you, everyone. So I'm closing the session and um, hope you can benefit from the networking event in the afternoon as well. And we look forward to your proposals and also uh, to your feedbacks. And maybe we can also uh, have another meeting for the next year's calls. Thank you.